So welcome everybody. My name is Peter Belles. I think I have an introduction slide for the beginning. I started my career in the finance sector. I switched over to telecommunications later on. I was managing a data management team and switched over back in 2010 to BI Consulting. Currently, I'm a pre and post sale position at Data Vault Builder, so that's my background. So everything that I say, always keep in mind that I have a biased opinion. I always think that we should start with business models, that automation is a thing that, that is important to do and stuff like that. But I try in this presentation to disconnect it from our product and just to explain the findings that we had when we were, were working with different clients with bi-temporal data, especially in the finance sector, banks, insurance businesses, and all the different issues they brought to the table. If anybody is interested, please connect on LinkedIn. I'm happy always as well to discuss different data modeling topics completely disconnected from the product I'm representing. So if there's anything interesting, if you have any open questions, I'm always happy to discuss. So what is my terminology I'm using here for different time access? And I'm reducing here already my presentation down to three relevant time access. I know in the insurance business, we have sometimes five to six, but let's keep it a little bit simple because we don't have too much time. So one very important timeline is the business validity. So if we have contracts from when to when this instance of a contract was valid, because my assumption is that over the lifetime of your insurance contract, there might be different versions. And just because you get a new version, it doesn't mean the old one is false or not correct. It's not a correction, it's really a new instance of the same contract with new parameters, maybe for the next year. And one of my clients teach me that they call this access 1D, like for the first dimension. And I think it's pretty simple to, to speak about that. So this is what I use in the blog series I have done on my webpage. And I will assume that we already worked through all this that we have on my webpage, but it's okay. I will explain if necessary what is really important for this presentation and you can read my blog series afterwards. The second timeline that we have here is a technical timeline, the inscription timeline. So when was something in scripted into your source system? I refer to this as the second dimension 2D and then for a data warehouse. In my case, it's usually a data vault data warehouse. We have a load time. So when did the analytical system became aware of this information, the load time and 3D. I know that in the past we call this sometime validity, but this was absolutely confusing with the business validity. So I'm using here the term as uh, standings that says here with the load time. I have here a lot of text as well in here that you can read later when you get the presentation with the links, then you can read it. And my assumption for this presentation is that we already did to try to simplify our problem, that we looked at the different requirements of our business users and we figured out that the inscription timeline that we are getting from the source system is relevant for us. Honestly, in many, many cases, in many, many industries, it isn't Then I honestly recommend to reduce the complexity already while processing your data before going to the report that it's not overwhelming and create wrong output. So let's assume we are in the finance industry and we have the requirement that's just given here. And what I don't do, because it would be even more complex if we have more than one technical timeline, this is especially given if you like load by temporal data from the raw world into the business world and we're adding one more timeline. So I'm just to limit a little bit the scope of what we're looking at here. So where did we see this kind of requirements, especially banking and insurance businesses. There is often a process called Tagesendverarbeitung in Germany, end of business day, uh, close of business day, day processing, where you say that at the end of every evening, there is stuff time stamped when it was really valid technically, and then it's exported and sent over to the analytical system. We have all the regulated businesses where we really need to prove when did we got knowledge about certain informations, like if, if there are credits created uh, or if you like uh, grant a credit to a customer, you need to prove which kind of information you had about this client that you're sure that he will not have too much debt and stuff like that. 
Then as well, the interesting thing, CDC, time, CDC sources have as well an inscription timeline that are giving us information when things really happened. And I come to this as a special case as well. And as well, if we have file transfers involved sometimes, the difference between when the data was extracted and until it was loaded into our data warehouse can be significant and there might be corrections because the file transfers were wrong, they were corrupted, stuff like that. So this is what I'm looking at and I will show you different solutions that we looked at and as well which solutions we didn't follow up on. So the first thing is if you have the three timelines is what we recommend and this is more in depth in my blog series is that I'm usually adding the business validity into an instance hub. So I have usually in the insurance business, I would create a contract and I would create a contract instance hub. And in that one, the valid from timestamp would be as well part of the business key. It's one solution. I know there are others, but let's assume this for making this very simple here. This is solved by this approach. So we keep the inscription time and the load time that we somehow need to solve. So again, what is the challenge of this kind of data is that we have external timeline and this external timeline might be the relevant timeline to report your data on. If you have end of business day reporting, it could be that you receive the information the following day. Still, if you create reports as of a specific day, it's the source system timeline that is relevant, not when the data warehouse got knowledge about it. For auditability, you maybe still need to prove it when you got knowledge about it, but you want to report based on this source system timeline. And usually we have a delay between the systems because if there is no delay, the inscription time and the load time is the same, then we wouldn't have the problem. And by having batch processing in data warehousing world, we usually can run into situations where we have several changes in the source system for one batch loading into the data warehouse. So we can't identify a change anymore just by the business key and the load time because there are several changes, but we need to have some other way to do it. And what we figured out when we tested it and piloted this kind of solutions with our clients, it that it happens again and again that we get out of order data. This can happen with file transfers, but it can happen as well with live systems like Kafka. That by design doesn't promise, uh, don't promise you that the messages will arrive in order. So it can be that this will change afterwards. So what are this kind of solutions for loading the inscription time from your source system? We could say the load time is just the same as the inscription time if the difference is very small. Second thing is we could say that we create between the source system and our data warehouse core an in between layer where we do a persistent staging where we just store all the changes and regularly just take the latest status from this to the target. One idea that we had and other people have had is just two throw away the load time and write in the column where the load time was foreseen, the inscription time. And the last solution that I will show you is the bitemporal satellite. And this is not the idea that we had, but I think that Thomas Herzog once presented this at, at a Data Vault user group presentation. And I didn't understood honestly back then why you would do that until I had really this kind of problems and I tried to load this kind of data. So thank you to him. The first thing is, Load time as proxy. So let's assume that we have a source stream and there is no latency and we load it directly in here. And yes, then we could just store the inscription time as an attribute, as information. We could create all the standard load processes on, sorry, one second. It sounds like somebody's dying in front of my office door. You would just use the load time, so it would be a standard load pattern. But the problem is, if there is any interruption in the stream, 
And this happens sometimes. Maybe some streaming service is rebooting or there is a disconnection or something like that. You will not know anymore what happened and then the queues can queue up and it will create a big mess. And the problem is if there are more than one change coming in at the same very, 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 very small batch size, you would need to load single rows and this slows down a lot your process or you do mini batches and then you can't load any more two changes at the same time to the same load time. So we tried that and we didn't do this anymore. So the second solution is that we put in a persistent staging in between. And what we did here is that we took the change ID of the source coming like from click replicate or golden gate. We wrote down everything and then we had a batch process with a very, very high cadence, taking just the latest status from here, saying it is okay that if we get within one second, like 50 updates, like certain source systems, go and create one update record for every single attribute. It is okay that after one second, we load it here into the data vault and everything is fine. And it was a solution for specific problems, but we figured out that if there is any delay of a few seconds and this is relevant, we wouldn't get it. So still we rely on that this process is running like very, very often and very, very stable, that there is no maintenance, there is no backup times that could maybe slow down this kind of process. And, and this is not a real world scenario. And as well, what we figured out is that if we get out of order information here, it could be that Kafka delivers us like first a B and later on they deliver us a, a, which was earlier. And if we go just look here at the latest information that we received, it could get out of order and stuff like that. And we cannot send backwards correction. So as well, this is not covering just all the cases that you can think of. But potentially for a limited set of problems, this could be a, issue, okay, a solution. So the next thing we came up is, would it be plausible to take the source inscription time and say, hey, we don't care about the load time. There are, in fact, companies that say, we don't care exactly when we got knowledge about this information in our reporting system, as long as this delay is not too big, let's say a day or two, that would be fine. So we just take the inscription time and we know that like on the 3rd of February, we can create a report for January and this will be perfectly fine. And funny thing is in that case, it would work if there are no backwards correction, because as soon as we get a backward correction, for a specific date back in the past, we try to load it again in the satellite, but there is already a value for this specific time. So what do we do with this record? We could write it like into a history table. We could delete it. We could say, no, we don't accept updates and stuff like that. So again, it would solve a part of the problem if we don't have out of order data, if we don't have corrections, but for sure, this is not auditable. So this was not applicable at all for the finance industry. So what came we up with? And uh, everything that I'm presenting here is not that it's our idea. I'm just bringing together what I've read from many other people. So the idea is here that we say our satellite is a multi-active satellite, but a special form of multi-active satellite. Why I'm highlighting this because Maybe some people know that I'm not the biggest fan of multi-active satellites because of the problems of Delta processing and stuff like that. But here, that's a really special case. And we say we know exactly what the subpartition key is. And the subpartition key here is the inscription time attribute. So we know that for any specific inscription time, there should be always one value. And if we get a new or changed value from the source system, we know that it's a correction and not an additional value that we need to store. So we have a perfect way as well to do delta loading and stuff like that. So what are the downsides of this? It's complex, yes, for sure. So we need a little bit different patterns for loading it, which are, if you want to do it performance, it can be quite difficult. And 
one main problem is that now the key of the entry in the satellite consists of three different parts. It's the hash, it's the load time, and it is the inscription time. And if you ever try to do joining on multiple columns in most database systems, that's usually not performing. Even if it might be better in any modern system, it's always less efficient than joining on one column. And we need to have now different views on top of this, because maybe we want to just to have a STD type one view. So you, we want to only get per load time and inscription time, uh, just for the latest inscription time and the newest load time one record. Or we want to get a STD type two view based on the inscription time. So for every inscription time, we want to just get the latest load time and stuff like that. And now we need to always deal with this combined key of three records. And this costs performance. So how to deal with that? So instead of creating our pits using this combination of keys, what we usually would do if we, we would take a standard approach, we would create really wide pit tables and the joining over three columns would cost a lot of performance. So Patrick Kuba came up with an idea and said, as we know that every satellite is only loaded by one process, why we don't add an index there? And if we add an index, we can represent the combination of the three columns of a hash key load time and the inscription time just with a simple integer. And this is very well described in his book. So I just joined it here because we have not much time. I don't go into details, but we tested this as well, if it's more performant and stuff like that. And the cool thing is by using this as well in the pit table, you don't need to have a special column for the hash key for every satellite, but you can as well create like your ghost record or your dummy record by using one number in the sequence. And you can have just in the pit table one call a single column joining to a satellite, which is very efficient for data storing and for performance. So in the pit, there's just one integer joining to every satellite. And the cool thing is that now the different views like STD type one or two view and the different perspectives can be created by very simple indexes. And this index is just one column wide and represents the integer. Now you can do an inner join on the different satellites and you get everything out exactly as you need it. And it becomes very, very performant. So when we had this, we thought, yes, now we, we, we finally solved all the problems and it's really cool to go on, but it turned out there's one more challenge. In fact, two, but let's start with the first. The first thing is that certain banks delivered us data every day with a new close of business day even if nothing changed. So they delivered us the whole customer base every day, here again, here again, still nothing changed. So it's uncompressed data. And now we needed to store it. And if we say that we just compared the data coming in based on the inscription time to the satellite, because we said, okay, we just need to check if it's a correction for a specific day. Every day we created a new snapshot of the data into the satellite. So what was the solution? We use now the same approach as before for a standard satellite. We go in and we say if something changed, okay, we write a new record. But for another satellite, if all the values didn't change, even if the inscription time changed, we just ignore that because the information stayed the same. So if we now output data, we can say for T0, it was X, but as well for the following date, it was always X. And this worked for more solutions. So we could compress the data, but the next problems came along. That some people delivered the data out of order. And especially in, in banks where we had a lot of file transfers, it can happen that they forgot to load the file, that the file was corrupt. And as well, this is from Patrick's book. He, he describes exactly this kind of problem. So it could be that on Monday, there's a value 6D arriving. On Wednesday, there is a value 6D arriving. And then on Tuesday, 
the value 6e arrives. And now if we did this kind of compression that I proposed here, we didn't store the value for Wednesday because we said it's the same as on Monday. So what happens is that now here, we have the value for Monday with 6d, we store now because it's different for Tuesday 6e, but the entry for Wednesday is missing. So how to solve that? And the solution is we have tracking satellites. So if you are storing data and we compare data and we realize that nothing changed, we don't write a new entry into the satellite itself to not duplicate data, but in the tracking satellite, we need to store that we received on this specific date, the value. So it means that if later on we want to inject something in between, which would be like a value A here instead of X, we would know that here at T1 it was X. So we need to re-inject it into this kind of satellite. And this is just to, to explain the problem. So we have compression and we have out of order arrivals. And the funny thing is that we, we, we did a pilot with about five clients when we implemented it and everybody told us this kind of scenario doesn't exist. And within two months, all of the clients that we did the pilots with experienced this kind of issue. It could be that sometimes they're loading streams, but like every two months, they want to resynchronize the base table, stuff like that. And it always happened in some kind of constellation that something arrived out of order. So in short, yes, do apply compression. But when you omit to write a satellite entry, you need to, to write a tracking satellite entry. And if there is a backward retroactive insert into the satellite, you need to check if after the inserts that you're doing retrospectively, you need to add a new satellite entry with the pre-existing value. So to recap this. My recommendation is always first check which timelines are really relevant for you. If, and if I say you for your clients, for, for your company, if a timeline is not necessary, think about it, if you can reduce it, if you can somehow cut through the different timelines and reduce the complexity. If the inscription time is relevant, implement it correctly. And this means that you need to cover all the potential cases and think really about as well, which of the cases that are presented here might apply somewhere in the future, in a few months to your data. Because if you create now a solution that will fail in three or four months, it, it's not worth probably it implementing it. Second thing is, if you implement it using a bi-temporal satellite, which in my opinion now, after working several months with this kind of patterns, is the right way to, to solve it in general way. You need to somehow improve performance. And I really like this idea of adding an index to the satellite. And for me, this is not like changing the pattern. For me, it's like an index that is explicitly stored in the table. So for me, it's just a way not of logically changing something, but technically just to get faster access to a specific line that works on all the database systems. It's just a technical implementation detail. With this index column, you can put on top of it different indexes, just including this, this simple integer number. And then by interjoining this kind of index tables, you can really get exactly from the bi-temporal data that you stored, the simplified cuts through the timelines that you need. And the cool thing is, if you create a pit table additionally to just only having one column to join, you can as well include the link to the ghost record into the same column so you can save again more columns in your pit tables. And content wise, I believe that you need to calculate with out of order arrival of data. So if you compress data, you need to have tracking satellites to have the full time history, even if you compress the data and you can restore the history if you need retrospectively adding some columns backwards. 
uh, some entries backwards. And that's in fact already it. And what is if you think, okay, this sounds right, but it's very complex, very simple. You could use an automation tool instead, but most probably the most people are interested in understanding this here. So if there are any questions, please feel free, then, then we can discuss it right now.